This is chapter three for abnormal psychology, and we're talking today about the etiology of mental disorders. This word etiology is a word that means something similar to causes, but it's not quite identical. So when we think of a cause of something, we're thinking more of a factor or a limited number of factors that have a direct relationship. Like if you knock down a domino, it hits the next domino and the next domino falls down. Etiology is a little bit broader than that because it, incurs, it includes things that are in the genes. It includes factors that happen before birth and just after birth. And it includes things that are in the environment and experiences that occur later in life. So there's a whole range of things that are in this and we consider that they might set the stage or the groundwork for the development of a mental disorder. We're going to talk today about six perspectives on what causes mental disorders. Um, and secondly, we'll talk about the diathesis stress model, which is a really major, I think, foundational model for explaining mental disorders. Within that, we'll talk about proximal and distal causes, about necessary, sufficient, and contributory causes, about how we can use correlational factors to inform causal relationships, about the diathesis stress model, and protective factors or resiliency. The story that I would give you to set the stage for this that I will ask you more about um, a little later is this true story of Daniel Petri, who at the age of 15, he, his parent, he had a video game, Doom, that his parents took away from him. And they took it away and they locked it in a safe deposit box. This is his parents. And um, they locked that, they took the game away from him and they put it in a safe deposit box in the family office. And in that same box locked in there happened to be a gun. And one day after the game had been taken away and he wanted it back, um, he d went into the safe deposit box to get it himself. And as he went into the deposit box to get it, he saw the gun and he got out the gun. And he walked into the family room where his parents were sitting on the couch with their backs to the door watching a football game on TV. And he said, Mom, Dad, I've got a surprise for you. And he shot them both. And many of you have probably been angry with your parents at some point or frustrated with them. And your parents may have made a decision that you didn't like. And yet I think none of you went and harmed your parents and he did and so we have to ask the question of whether we would consider him normal or whether he crosses over that line for abnormal behavior and we can certainly say his behavior was out of the ordinary but what was the source of it so there has to be a psychological underpinning in order for it to be um, considered a psychological disorder so we'll talk more about that later but for right now we might consider is his behavior abnormal and so then let's think about it. What causes might there be in his life for this outcome? And if you were sitting in a live class, I would ask you to write them down. And you're sitting in this class online, I hope, listening to this. So what causes would there be? What would you say if you were sitting in the group? What might have caused him to act as he did? Or what is the etiology of his behavior? And so we're going to revisit this, but for now we're going to just leave this sit. And I want you to, th to just note that we had an abnormal behavior and, we, and that act was the action of shooting his parents in order, to get a video, in order to get a video game back. And we have, um, you in your mind have thought of five causes that you think contributed to the development of this abnormal behavior. So keep those in mind and let's go on. So in your chapter this week, you'll be talking about these perspectives on, normal, on abnormality. And these are the same perspectives. This is in fact the same slide that I use at the start of one of the lectures in personality theory. And we might kind of think about that, right? We can think maybe of abnormality being just extremities of personality, maybe, you know, maybe. So we all have traits. 
And so what are the explanations for how we become who we are and how those same explanations come into play for determining uh, whether we are abnormal or not for causing us to have some characteristic that leads us into the realm of unnormal. So we might say the psychodynamic perspective, my id made me do it. And by id, we mean internal forces like your inner child who needs, 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 needs to survive. And if that it never developed, never learned to rationally, to understand, to alter behavior, to use more modified techniques and could find their needs met, then we might say, well, there's some inner self that's driving you to do it and you'll need to resolve that conflict inside of you, whatever those things that you learned to get the attention of your parents or whatever it was. That would be the psychodynamic perspective. So Freud. Jung, who would go on and say, oh, it's not just your personal infancy and childhood. We also have like the spiritual realm, like the you're inherited from your population and those things are influencing you to do it. A second perspective we might consider is biological perspective. We are, after all, a bunch of cells with genes, with DNA inside each one. We all have bodily functions. We have hearts that elevate quickly or elevate more slowly. We have heart rates that slow down more easily after we get excited. We have different um, uh, metabolism for our food, okay? Different ability to fall asleep easily. So those are all our biological differences. And maybe it's these biological differences that cause someone to either have a strong personality or to develop a disorder. Or maybe, Maybe these are just a bunch of learned behaviors. We can think of Skinner, Thorndike. Maybe growing up, you were just reinforced for certain things, maybe for being quiet and shy. You were reinforced for it. Your parents thought you were good when you were being quiet and shy. And now you're so quiet and shy that you're anxious and neurotic. Right? Maybe somehow that was reinforced in your environment or punished. Maybe Erickson and people who talk about the social realm we grow up in, maybe they're right. You know, maybe in our earliest, maybe in our younger years, we weren't given enough autonomy or we were taught to be ashamed of ourselves too much. Maybe the world around us taught us to be ashamed and now we can't hardly take any action and we're really passive. So we'd consider shame. Or maybe, um, maybe our parents got divorced and right when we were needing to have our own autonomy and safe home, our parents got divorced and that all got threatened. Or maybe there was child abuse. Something like that. Maybe the teachers that you had in school were just really cruel and so you learned to hate learning. So all these would be part of the social environment and maybe all that contributes to you not liking learning. Or maybe it's just the way you think. Maybe you have, that we'd consider maybe back here. Maybe your thinking is off and you tend to focus or ruminate too much on bad things. All right. Or maybe you tend to think you have to please everyone. So maybe all these things are emerging for you. Maybe the guy who had to keep giving things away, he just has a thought disorder like he thinks he doesn't deserve to have things. The humanistic perspective, my quest for meaning made me do it. Um, so in this case, we might think of, uh, we would have Maslow and Rogers consider these humanists, a lot of others as well, but these are some of the fathers. And they might say every organism wants to maximize its potential. We need to maximize what we can offer, what we can be in this lifetime. And that in that quest to maximize, maybe we've gone too far. Maybe we raided the capital or something like that. The humanistic perspective offers that we have needs that must be met, our basic needs, 
Um, this is the hierarchy of needs you'll be familiar with it very likely for food, water, warmth, rest. Are those needs met? Were they met when we were young? And if so, or if not, what did we learn? And after those needs are met, we have to have our safety needs met. We have to be safe. We have to be secure. We have to know that our parents aren't going to attack us. We have to know that our home and environment is safe. And what if we don't? Well, we might have that need persisting in our lifetime. We might be afraid. So belongingless and love leads are next. Once we feel our basic needs are met and our safety needs are met, then we have to find out that we're loved and that we belong. As humans, we're social beings. And as social beings, if we don't have that group, then we are going to be um, possibly die, a risk of death. And so we have to have our belongingness needs met. And what if we're rejected? What if we have like a stutter, you know, or some sort of a social difficulty and we're rejected? If this is a fundamental need, this is going to keep playing out. And what do we do if we're rejected? We don't belong. Are we able to go on and succeed in society by having our self-esteem needs met? By achieving, by doing speeches, by fitting in, by getting a good job? No, this is going to have to come first. We're going to be stuck here, always trying to belong, always needing. But once these are met, we find that person, we're now safe, then we need to have um, our esteem needs met, which we can do by feelings of accomplishment, by doing things, getting a good job. And if our, and then our esteem needs, no, not yet working. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. My dog is very eager for a walk, and I'm going to leave here shortly, I guess. Um, so this is our prestige, the things we do to be successful in this world. So if we're not successful in this world, if we're not seeking these ends, maybe it's because some of these earlier needs haven't been met. And lastly, and this might be someone who's more later in adulthood, might be self-actualizing, really seeking to fulfill that potential, including creative activities. And that's the goal. But if we're stuck down here, my goodness. And so what if those physiological needs aren't met? How is that going to play out in terms of our abnormal behavior? What about security needs? Or belonging, if we don't belong? Might we attack people, try to take people? Might we join subversive groups? What if our esteem needs were failing at our job? Might we become depressed? And so all that might lead to disorder when we should be having that self-fulfilling last stage. So I want you to think of traits and traits that can morph into abnormality. Resting on a continuum. And this continuum, um, let's say this is the best and the least, the most and the least for human trait. Let's say that trait is anxiety, and this is the most anxious person in the world. There's no one who can be more anxious. It is the top end of the human capacity. This is the least anxious. Bob Marley down here. And let's say we have a genetic makeup that puts us right about here for anxiety. So our genotype has a nervous system that is kind of reactive. Our heart rate increases quickly, and it doesn't slow down well. So our parasympathetic is slow. Our amygdala, just from the time we're born, tends to be really active. So as a baby, maybe we cried a lot or we shied away from things. And that's just the way we were born. That's our genotype. But our phenotype might not be right here. Maybe our phenotype comes out to be right here. Or maybe our phenotype is here. How could this happen? And we would say that this is the gene, but this is the environment. 
So if we are born at this level of potential anxiety, and we have parents who are also anxious and encourage our fears, then we might end up with a phenotype way down, way here, more anxious. So our environment exacerbated our trait. Or maybe our phenotype is down here because we have a family that really supported us and let us know all was well and encouraged us to move forward and our phenotype became less anxious. Both of those are possible. And let's think of all the traits that way. Maybe someone had a genotype that was up here and then it was exacerbated in the environment so it got way up here and now it's abnormal. Maybe. Um, so what are the risk factors for developing a disorder? And we can think about these in three ways, necessary, sufficient, and contributory causes. So necessary factors are factors that have to exist for the disorder to occur. Like if Y occurs, it, the only reason it could have happened is if X preceded it. Sufficient and contributory, and I'll talk about these on separate slides. So without this predisposition, the condition cannot occur. So for example, if you have a trisomy on your genotype in the um, 21st chromosome, that is a necessary condition for the development of Down syndrome. That is, if you have Down syndrome, you definitely have this trisomy on the 21st chromosome. Or if you, uh, the syphilis is a necessary condition for the development of general paresis. You can't get it unless you had syphilis. So those are necessary causes, but they're relatively infrequent for mental disorders. We also have sufficient causes. And these are um, some sort of a thing that if you have it, it guarantees that the occurrence of a disorder will occur, but the disorder could also occur without it. So for example, hopelessness and depression. So if you have a high level of hopelessness, there's strong evidence that, that, that depression is going to occur. So there's a, pretty, uh, there's a direct relationship here, but you can get depression without hopelessness. So you could get depression as a result of, you know, giving birth or suffering a loss. So depression doesn't have to have hopelessness before it, but hopelessness does lead to depression. Yeah. All right, and the contributory cause is the third, a condition that increases the likelihood of a disorder. If X occurs, Y is more likely to occur. Like child abuse makes it more likely that you'll develop borderline personality disorder. Traumatic head injury makes it more likely that you're going to develop dementia. The gene for depression makes it more likely that you're going to develop depression. So in each case, the outcome can occur without the presence of the condition, but these factors create the conditions in which it can occur. And I think of disturbed ground. It's like setting the earth. It's creating the soil in which something can happen. And when, for example, you disturb the so soil by tearing up the trees, you create the conditions in which thistles can grow. They're not necessarily going to grow, but the conditions are right. And if the seed is planted, they'll probably take off. And that's how we can think of these contributory causes. We also think of risk factors in terms of proximal and distal risk factors. So proximal factors, proximal means near. And so these are factors that happen near to the point in time of the emergence of the disorder. We can call them the precipitants, and I've used this word a little bit with you, or the causes that occur right next to it, like for example, the loss of a parent. If a depression or an emotional response happens right after that, then that's a proximal cause. A traumatic event. If there's a traumatic event and then anxiety develops, there's a proximal cause. An injury might be one of those, a particular stressor. The onset of puberty might even be a proximal cause. It happened near the time of the emergence of the condition. Distal causes are far from the time of the emergence of the condition, like a predisposition. Causes um, that occur often early in life, and they set the stage for an outcome to emerge. And from that previous list, that genetic, that gene leading to depression would be an example of a distal cause. 
think something that might have happened at birth could be a distal cause. So how can we know what causes an outcome? Only through empirical evidence. And the empirical evidence ideally would be an experiment. So let's just, but we often can't. And so let's look at this for a moment. We know that divorced people are overrepresented in mental health care. So does this mean that divorce causes mental illness? Well, let's just do something like this. Let's say that what we have is a correlation. And if we put, let's put divorce and breakups down here. And up on this y-axis, let's put mental health care. I'm just going to abbreviate it MH. And let's say the more divorces we or breakups we have, more likely we are to be in mental health care. And so the correlation would look like this. And let's say it was a pretty moderate to strong correlation, something like that, meaning that the more divorces, breakups you have, the more likely to be in mental health care. Does this, can we then conclude that divorce causes mental illness? Is divorce a necessary or a sufficient? Is it a necessary cause? Is it a sufficient cause? Is it a contributory cause? And we could say from the data we have, this correlational data, we cannot say for sure. We cannot say for sure that it causes mental illness because let's think about the way it could be. Is it possible? It's possible that going through a divorce or a breakup contributes to the need for mental health care. You know, that's a threat. If we look at Maslow's model, that's a threat to your very basic need for belongingness or maybe even for safety and security. So yeah, it could definitely lead someone to want to seek mental health care. But is it also possible that having some sort of a mental struggle, like having anxiety or depression, could that lead to greater likelihood of divorce? Could it be in the opposite direction? So this is the first explanation. Divorce causes mental, you know, causes people to seek mental health. Could it be that seeking mental health care or that having a mental mental health problem causes you to, seek, to want to have more divorces or breakups? And we could say, yeah, that's definitely a problem. If you have a lot of, you know, if you have a lot of anxiety or depression, those things really can take a toll on a relationship. So maybe it's actually that the mental health problem led to the divorce. That's a second possible explanation. Or third, can we think of some factor that contributes both to mental illness or mental health and to divorce? And we could say certainly. It could be that this was kind of a bad home this person grew up in. Unstable, the bad home led to mental illness, they were, got depressed, they were anxious, and the bad home led them to not have good relationships because they have a, a weak attachment style. So we can think about this with respect to correlation, and so we can't draw causal conclusions from correlational findings, but let's take a look at this, um, the possible causes of depression. Um, and I'm just going to play forward a little bit of a scene here. So let's say child abuse contributing to depression. So first we ask, is X associated with Y? Is child abuse associated with depression? And the answer is yes. Okay, now we know there's a correlation. The second question we have to ask is, does X child abuse precede Y depression in time? Did the child abuse come before the depression or not? And if the answer is yes, the child abuse came first and then later on the person got depressed, then we consider that child abuse is a risk factor. If no, then it's concomitant, they emerged at the same time. But if it's a risk factor, could it be changed? Take the child out of the abusive situation or is it too late? That happened a long time ago. And so if no, it happened a long time ago, it can't be changed, then that's a risk factor that has to be dealt with in therapy. But if yes, it's a variable risk factor. If this you know, child has this risk factor and the, the, the abuse started and then they became depressed, but we can take them out of the abusive situation, 
that it's a variable risk factor. So if we take them out of that situation, does it change to the depression? And if the answer is yes, and only if the answer is yes, can we say that this is a causal risk factor? So female, being female is linked to depression. Females are more likely to get depressed or at least to report depression. So is female associated with depression? Yes. Does X precede Y in time? Yes, you become female before you get depressed. Can it be changed? No, it's a fixed risk factor. So it's a risk factor, but we can't ever experiment with it. And so it's considered a, a fixed risk factor. And so what about family history? We know that certain kinds of family histories contribute to depression, and we can follow the same line of questioning. For most of us, family history is in the past and can't be changed. Breakup we talked about, substance abuse. This is an interesting one. If there's a substance abuse situation, is the substance abuse associated with depression? Yes. Did the substance abuse come first? If so, that might be the risk factor. If it's a risk factor, can it be changed? Yeah, the person gets out of addiction. And that means it could be a causal risk factor. If indeed, if you change it and then the depression changes. Sleep disturbance is linked. We have to, this one is very actively considered now, which causes which. And social ostracism and early puberty, all of these are linked. And so we can think about all of these as they relate to, um, as they relate to depression and whether they are possibly causal risk factors. Um, now, we have to remember that all of these causes are bi-directional. So we think of this child having behavior problems, but his dad, you know, causing it by his own behaviors. That's often how we think about it. But we have to remember that this little child was born with a certain biological, physiological nature, and maybe he had all of those characteristics that made him really difficult. And this child, this dad, doesn't exist in a vacuum. And so maybe this temper comes out only after a lot of provocation by the child. So the father influences the child's behavior most definitely, but the child also influences the father's behavior. So we can think of a bi-directional relationship. And with respect to this, um, a gene environment correlation is what we're talking about. So passive effects, the parent genes shape the child genes. So in fact, this boy got his genes from his father and maybe those genes happen to have this heightened amygdala activation. We have active effects. We have parenting, the way the parent's genes cause him to act toward the child, but we also have the child's nature that causes him to make choices. And involved here are evocative effects, meaning the child's behavior evokes behaviors in the parent. So the child's anger, it doesn't also operate in a bathroom and it influences the parent as well. So a bi-directional causal relationship. So at this time, I'm hoping that you will have looked at this video. Um, it is linked if you click on the slide, but I'm not going to put it in here because it changes the uh, size of the video and makes it hard to download. So please make sure and watch that. And it's also linked on our course page. So um, what we're looking at here then is the diathesis stress model. <clears throat> and diatheses are another word for preconditions that we've just been talking about. So setting the stage or creating the, the, the groundwork in which a disorder can emerge. And I generally, and I think your book describes diatheses as things that are happening more early on, kind of distal from the actual onset of the condition. But they can still happen over the course of time. And then there'll be a final stressor that will trigger the disorder. So, so your book presents two um, frameworks for the development of a condition and its relationship with stress. And both of these seem to come into play in different circumstances. So we know that low, so we're looking at on the x-axis the level of stress. We're looking on the y-axis at the probability of depression. And we know that low level of stress corresponds with low probability of depression. But it varies depending on whether there are diatheses. So if there are these preconditions and we have low stress and then we don't have these preconditions present, then even under high stress, we don't have 
depression emerging. If we have um, an increasing level of stress and medium level of diathesis as represented in this orange line, then we have uh, the probability of depression is greater. And if we again have high stress um, and a high level of diathesis or preconditions, then the probability of depression is quite high. That's the interactive model because the diathesis interact with the stress and cause a difference in the outcome, difference in the depression level. The additive model, it all kind of adds on together as is suggested in the title. So you can see the lines are all parallel here. So it's not like the level, the chances of getting stress. In this first model, the interactive model, the chances of getting stress increase quite markedly. Excuse me. The chances of getting depression increase quite markedly as the diathesis increase. But in this model, they don't. They in direct proportion to the diathesis. So if you have no diathesis, you're going to have still some. If you have a high level of stress, even without diathesis, you're going to have an elevated level of likelihood of depression. Medium level of diathesis, the same pattern. So a greater likelihood of depression, even under low stress conditions, if you have a medium level of diathesis, and those continue at the same trajectory up into the high stress area. If you have a high level of diathesis, even if you have low stress, you're still going to have some greater likelihood of experiencing depression, which increases in a similar fashion to the level of stress. So you'll read about these more in your book, but that's kind of a nutshell of what they're talking about.